doubting words inside us is not our enemy. It's a guide to set real objectives, not fantasies. And many people have a fantasy that's not strategically planned into an objective, which is what the executive center does. It mitigates the risks and gives you a, a real strategy in how you can achieve this so your vision is clear. And I stick to those. And so I wrote it down. I even have the vision that I actually started with that's painted in my office right now. But I wrote out exactly how I wanted it. And I would sometimes spend an hour on one paragraph defining it exactly how I want. So if I want to go to every country, I went and started looking at what is every country on the planet. I went to American Express Travel Service and I said, I want a brochure from every country around the world so I could cut out pictures of where these places were. I was very detailed about that and I still am. And I've got this 33 volume collection of goals, <clears throat> metrics, gratitudes, uh, objectives sitting in my possession now. Dr. John, welcome back to the Superhuman Life. Thank you for having me back. <laughs> yeah, it's been a uh, it's been a journey that we've had to uh, jump through some hoops here today. But like I was telling you, it's always those uh, ones that take a little bit of work to make happen that to really turn into magic. So, you know, you've built a really incredible life. I know we talked a little bit about your ship, but tell us what's going on with the world ship, where you're uh, where you're docked right now, and kind of what's you know what's going on in in the life of Dr. John. Martini these days? Well, I'm actually off the ship temporarily right now while I'm filming a couple of movies in Houston, Texas. So I'm here filming and doing a program there and doing some podcasts while I'm here. But the ship is in the Middle East. Well, it's in Turkey right now. And it goes over to Cyprus, then Israel, then Egypt, and then through the Suez Canal, Sharm el Sheikh, and goes over to the Suez Canal, then into the Emirates, and then Saudi Arabia, then India, then Sri Lanka, then the Maldives. Um, Seychelles, and it just and then it comes back into the Mediterranean for uh, or when it comes into January, February, it comes back to the Mediterranean. So we just move around nonstop. Yeah. Around the world. So so incredible. I mean, um, nomad at the at the highest level. When did this start? You know, what was the what was the inspiration? Like, I don't want to have a house. I want to live on a boat and travel the world. <laughs> Well, I had 11 homes at one time. So when my wife was alive, she passed away almost 18 years ago. When she was alive, she had a uh, a tendency to have want to have a house where we went. And I, and I thought, and she liked to buy stuff, you know. And so I thought maybe if I get a ship, it would she would not buy as much because it would sink the ship. And that might save us some income. But anyway, um, no, that's not it. We were living in Trump Tower for the late 90s. Uh, Till 2001. So we were in the Trump Tower. We were on the 62nd floor there. And um, had a beautiful place there. 9 11 occurred. And we also had some homes in about five other locations, six other locations at the time. And my, and my wife didn't um, want to be in New York after 9 11. She says, I'm out of here. This is crazy. Because they shut down the building and she was left on the street. And so, because they thought Trump Tower might be another place where they'd target. So she got a private helicopter illegally and picked her up in the street and took her to Philadelphia and got a jet to go to LA and a jet over to Australia. No, no commercial jets were flying. So just got a private one and just went over to Australia and just chilled out in the, our places over there. And then when I said, I told her, I said, look, I'm, I don't have but four conferences a year in, in Australia right now booked. So I'm not going to see you uh, with my traveling as easily. We need to come to plan B. And so I had seen the ship in the Rob report um, in 1999. And I thought, wow, this is great. And I ripped it out, you know, right out of a uh, doctor's office. I just ripped it out. I thought this would be perfect. Because I've always said the universe is my, my playground. The world, world is my home. Every country is a room and house. Every city is a platform to share my heart and soul. I've always thought the world was home. Socrates and, and uh, Einstein and Epictetus all said that, the, you know, we're citizens of the world, not, not local thing. So I've always believed I was a world citizen. So it turned out that as an anniversary present, um, I got the ship so we would be able to see each other more because it was moving around and I could get to the ship a lot easier than just to one country. So I got the ship for that. And um, that was 21 years ago. And so here I am 21 years later. I just haven't been able to find a better dress. There is no better dress on the planet. Than so, everywhere. Yeah, it's a, like a six-star floating resort going around the world with private owners you know, just a handful of us that travel around the world. But what's neat is the the, the people are fantastic. The places are amazing. Uh, the things we get to do. We have Nobel Prize winners coming on and educating us. I mean, it's just a very cool place. 
and it goes all over the world from the north the south antarctica arctica you name it everywhere where we go the french polynesians or whatever it might be iceland and um so i've been on there and i sold all the other homes we had we had 11 homes in making us in south africa and australia and texas all these places just got rid of them all and simplified now i have just the ship that's it simplified put all my investments into different investments and companies and things and just kept it simple so now i'm either at a hotel or i'm on the ship yeah so beautiful man i just i i i I love your mind and I love the way that you think and just hearing you say like the world is my address. Like, man, it's like, you just, you see something, you want it, you just go get it. And I know growing up, you spent a lot of your teens living on the streets. I think you ran away from home at 13, 14 years old. Dr. John, how much do you think of the time that you spent growing up on the streets has created this fearlessness that you just go out and attack and do anything you want to do? Well, I still have my fears. I don't want to give impression that I don't have my anxieties. You know, okay. I I, uh, I always tell them uh, if, if if I had twenty four Victoria's Secret miles, I would have the fear of loss of them. <laughs> <laughs> Not joking, that wouldn't be true. But uh, but um, no, I I have anxieties and fears too, just like anybody else. But I can't imagine myself not doing what I set out to do. That just I I only focus on what's truly highest in priority in my life. The thing that I feel it's 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 impossible for me not to do. It's my destiny. It's just, it, I, that's what I focus on, and I delegate a hell out of stuff. I'm 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 good at teaching, researching, and writing, and traveling. That's it. I'm useless outside that. So I have everybody else do everything else. I haven't driven a car in 32 years. You know, I've got the pilots, the, the chauffeurs. I got the captain. I got oh, the cleaners, the people at shop. I delegate everything, so I just do what I am core competently capable of doing. And that liberates, if people would do that, it liberates. Because anytime you're doing lower party things that you need some sort of external motivation to do, you devalue yourself. And if you go and do what you absolutely love to do and inspired by it, there's no friction. <laughs> and if you learn the art of taking whatever happens in your life and asking, how is it on the way, not in the way, how is it helping me fulfill my mission? Nothing really interferes with your life. It's all perception. We have control over our perception, decisions, and actions, so we might as well take our perceptions and turn them into opportunities too, and then take our actions and put them. If we if we take our perceptions and link them to our highest value, and we take our actions and live by our highest priority, and make a decision to either change our perception or change our actions and delegate things. Uh, and people say, "Well, that's nice. He's got wealth and stuff." No, I was a street kid. I got wealth because I did that. I got wealth because I did that, not because I had wealth. Then I yeah. did it. So where does, that, where does that limiting belief come with people? Why do so many people struggle with delegation? Or is it they're struggling with the delegating, the, the, the passing of, of it off? Or is it they're struggling with the losing of control? It's lots of things. You know, thousands of years ago, human beings were supposedly nomadic, right? It seemed that we lived in nomadic environment. And then we started doing sedentary life where we, you know, started planting and planting cultures. So when we did that, we started to differentiate our specialties instead of doing everything. And we were not as effective doing everything as we were when we got our specialties. So our specialties made it where we became dependent on other people. And so the fear of rejection from other people uh, and fear of banishment and exile from people, the fear of rejection from society became more and more important to people. And they want to fit in because they didn't survive if they didn't. And so it's an instinct now not to lose, you know, acknowledgement from people and to have a, uh, you know, the impulse to be completely independent is frightening. And the fear of losing acknowledgement is frightening because you might banish. So that's their deep instincts and impulses sitting inside us. And most of us are afraid to go against the herd. And so whatever the herd says, which is mediocrity, I mean, the, 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 the herd is not the Nobel Prize winners. The herd is not the gold medal. The herd is not the big CEOs of the companies. It's a, the herd is not the, you know, you know, Olympic medalist. The, the, the herd is the average. So if we don't transcend the impact of the herd, we're going to not get hurt. We're going to, I always say, instead of following a culture, build a culture. I'm a firm believer in just building a culture. So I'd rather go build my own freaking culture than just follow some system that's out there. So I think that's what holds people back is they're afraid to go against the, the herd. 
and they're, they're afraid to just give themselves permission to be different. But everybody, when I ask people, how many of you want to make a difference in the world? They all put their hands up. How are you going to make a difference fitting in? You're going to make a difference standing out. What I really wanted to spend some time on here today is, is designing a master plan for, for our life. I heard you recently talk about like this, I don't know how many thousands of pages, and I know you've spent your entire life creating this, this master plan. Can you kind of share with us how you document everything you do? And I think that we can maybe really spend some time here really, really unpacking that for people. Because I think in order to transcend the herd, in order to create an impactful life, in order to reach fulfillment, reap meaning, reap purpose, like we have to start with a plan of what it is we actually want to accomplish. So how have you kind of documented your, your, your life? What I do is I, first of all, I started, when I first started doing my master plan, well, I wrote down what I knew. I started with what I knew. Okay. So when I first started my master plan, I was 17. And I said, I want to learn how to read because I was, I was a learning disabled as a child. I didn't read till I was 18. I wanted to learn how to read. I wanted to learn how to speak because I had a speech impediment as a child. And that's the reason I also left school because I had I, school. I didn't pass. And I didn't really run away from home exactly because my parents didn't kick me out or I didn't leave. I, I, I had fantastic parents, but they saw that I wasn't going to make it in school and they saw that I wanted to go surfing. <laughs> so I took off surfing and lived at the beach and then hitchhiked to California and down into Mexico. And I wanted to go around the world surfing. So that was my thing. And they, my parents said, at least you're going to excel at something. You might as well do that. I wrote down what I knew. I knew I wanted to overcome my learning problems. I knew I wanted to learn how to speak properly. I knew I wanted to learn how to read. And I wanted to be somehow intelligent. I, I didn't want to be, a, a, I had to wear a dunce cap when I was in first grade. So I, I wanted to be intelligent. And I wrote those down. And that led me to eventually getting a dictionary and memorizing 30 words a day in a dictionary until my vocabulary was strong enough. And my mom, when I eventually moved back to Texas when I was 18, my mom tested me on 30 words a day and how to pronounce them, how to pronounce them properly, how to describe the meaning of it. And I would work part of the day on 30 words and just memorize the words and recite. I had to write them out 20 times with a definition. And just every day we put 30 more words in there. At the end of two years, that's 20,000 words. <laughs> so I went on back to school then, and then I started to excel. And I started writing down uh, my goals as they came, but I only wrote things that I felt were certain. I didn't want to write fluffy stuff. I knew I wanted to travel the world. So I wrote down, I want to step foot on every country in the face of the earth. I How are I you wanted... gauging certainty? I'm sorry. I don't want to, I don't want to cut you here, but I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm really curious how you're gauging like the certainty in yourself. If I don't, if I'm having any anxiety, see, anytime you have, you're in your amygdala and not in your executive center, your amygdala wants to avoid pain and seek pleasure, and it wants to set up fantasies. And whenever you have a fantasy, your intuition comes in with an anxiety to say, hey, BS, 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 BS. And so when I would hear that BS, 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 I would hear this anxiety. Who are you to say that? Who, was that crazy? They can't do that. How are you going to do that? And everything else. And I would just start with what I had no, no noise. See, that, that doubting words inside us is not our enemy. It's a guide to set real objectives, not fantasies. And many people have a fantasy that's not strategically planned into an objective, which is what the executive center does. It mitigates the risks and gives you a, a real strategy on how you can achieve this so your vision is clear. And I stick to those. And so I wrote it down. I even have the vision that I actually started with that's painted in my office right now. It's five foot by four foot big painting of the vision that I started. But I wrote out exactly how I wanted it. And I would sometimes spend an hour on one paragraph, two hours on a paragraph, defining it exactly how I want. So if I want to go to every country, I, I went and started looking at what is every country on the planet. I made a list of them alphabetically. Then I said, okay, I want to go and speak there. I want to go and educate there. I want to, you know, travel that world. So I, then I started looking at all the major hotel ballrooms, all the convention centers, all the theaters. And I, when, when, I, when online came later on in life, I could just cut and paste those. But I went on and I went, to, I went to American Express Travel Service and I said, I want a brochure from every country around the world so I could cut out pictures of where these places were. So I, I was very much, a, you know, this doing the secret stuff before the secret came out a long time ago. But, but I, I was very detailed about that and I still am. And I've got this 33 volume collection of goals, <clears throat> metrics, 
gratitudes uh, objectives sitting in my possession now. Yeah, and it's that level of, of of detail when people are hearing at one point in your life you're you know you owned eleven houses like you live on this world ship and you travel and speak to reach millions of people and it's like nine eleven hit wife needs a helicopter order a private helicopter order a private jet fly across the world it's like how can this guy do this because the level of detail that you're executing your vision starting from like it's gotta it, it's it, it's it's gotta happen so i want to come back to that point when you're you know maybe we're talking about this amygdala here we're kind of feeling this anxiety and fear so that initial kind of doubt surfaces you don't accept the first doubt as like no i can't do this how do you begin to process this and get it moving into the executive center so you can begin to think more more clearly the executive center sets an objective okay objective means neutral that means you've thought out every positive that you want and you thought out every negative that's going to come with it because haven't you ever gone out on a date with somebody you thought was going to be, wow, it's going to be more advantages and disadvantages. And then a day, a week, a month, a year, five years later, you went, ooh, fatal attraction. Didn't think about that. Didn't think about that. Didn't think about that. And it grounded you back to see that there's a pair of opposites of benefits and drawbacks to every relationship. Well, the objective is not waiting through the fantasy with anxieties to get to the objective. It's looking for the downsides and obstacles and preparing for them and mitigating them in advance. Elon Musk doesn't make it to Mars without foresight. He has engineers there and specialists in there thinking of every possible thing that could go wrong. And how do we mitigate that? How do we solve that in advance? Foresight is way more powerful than hindsight. When they did the James Webb telescope and they launched that baby into place, they hired 13 companies to scrutinize their strategy and to make sure there's no flaws in it. 13 companies were hired to make sure, is there anything you can see that could go wrong here, go wrong here, go wrong here? So an objective is something that you're not wanting positive thinking on. You're wanting balanced thinking on. What is it that I want to accomplish? What are the challenges and cha the obstacles I might run into and how do I solve in advance so I'm prepared? So if this happens, plan B, plan C, plan D, plan E, plan F, no problem. I'm prepared. So I learned a long time ago that if I'm having those little voices in there, it's not because I got a weakness. It's not because I'm, I'm frightened. It's not because of anything other than I haven't thought of those in advance and prepared for them. And they're coming up because I have a fantasy and I'm blocked out all the negatives and I've only seen the fantasies. The fantasies are positive without a negative. The nightmare comes in to balance it, to bring them back into balance. So when I, when I finally realized that many, many years ago, I got that, that savvy I realized I don't want to, to ignore that doubt. I want to use that doubt to refine my package, my, my objective. And that's planning. And that's uh, Alec McKenzie in his time trap wrote a beautiful piece on that. And in, by doing the planning and seeing that and knowing what is highest in priority for you to do and delegating the rest expedites the whole process. So I, I mean, I'm, you do the planning so you can delegate because otherwise you're trapped doing stuff. And you're having to do stuff that's not inspiring. And then you have to be motivated to do it. And that's not how to live. Motivation is a symptom, not a solution for human beings. And delegation and being prioritizing something that serves people. If you're not doing something that absolutely serves people, that is something that people will pay for to be able to make your vocation your vacation, you're going to be sitting there having Monday morning blues, Wednesday hump days. Thank God it's Friday because the week freaking ends all the time. And you're going to have anxieties because you're going to be searching to escape that doldrum to go on for a fantasy. That's why most people want to get a vacation. They want to get a, a, a break. They go to Starbucks and wait 30 minutes in a line. They want to get a long vacation. They want to escape. They, they live vicariously with other people's brands instead of building their own brands. And they hurry up and want to retire so they can die. This is not. The people I know that are inspired by what they do, they, they don't even think about retirement. They're busy. Bill Gates isn't thinking about retirement. Warren Buffett's not retiring. Charlie Munger's not retiring. You know, I don't see... Donald or anybody, that, any of the guys out there that are kind of out there in the world that really are doing things, I don't see them retiring. I see them. I, what else can I do? You know, the wise individual pursues challenges that inspire them so they don't get trapped by challenges that don't. That's the basic game. Now, what if somebody is caught in, in an addictive pattern here? So I don't know if you recall this from the first conversation we had. I know I didn't share it with you today, in addition to running this podcast, I work. So we have a company, Rebuild Recovery, that specifically helps men overcome pornography addiction. These guys are caught up in a perpetual cycle of chasing fantasies in pornography. 
They know that it's, 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 it's not right. They're trying to break it, but there's that addictive pattern, that addictive cycle. So with the discussion that we're having here, if that is the case, I'm always chasing, always chasing. I know it's not right. I, I, I know what I want, but I'm stuck in the addictive cycle. How can someone break that? The addictive cycle is a dopamine driven, very commonly an oxytocin driven uh, amygdala response. The nucleus accumbens light, lights up and you get this addictive and, and you won't find an addiction without a subdiction. A subdiction is some wound in their past that they're trying to escape and they're trying to get a pleasure to compensate for it, to escape the memory and thoughts and ruminations of all the, the, the thought of whatever this was. Could be that somebody had a rough childhood or incest or some caught masturbating or who knows what it is out there that's driving it. And if you don't go and do high priority actions that are meaningful, you're going to end up in the amygdala. If, if, it, if you, have a, you have a set of priorities in life, if you live by the highest priority, the executive center comes online. The executive center is responsible with glutamate and GABA transmitters to calm down the impulses and instincts, the philias, the phobias, the addictions, the subdictions. It calms it down. So if that addictor is not going after and finding something that's extremely deeply meaningful to it that they can focus on and inspire on, they're more vulnerable to their amygdala. I had a, a, a guy, I got to show this story, worth about $750 million at a multi-billion dollar company, retired, delegated it out, retired from it, and then went from a few social drinks to 18 to 20 a day. Drink, 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 drink. Became a slosh, gained weight, puffy, red. And his consultant was trying to get him to shift it. And he said, John, I need help. So I got him on the, on the, the Zoom thing. And I said, all right, when did, when did this really escalate? He said, it's about two and a half years ago. It's just been escalating. I said, what happened two and a half years ago? Um, I sold my company. Okay. You're going back into work. He said, what do you mean? He said, you got out of your company because there were some parts of your company that you hadn't delegated and you were doing that were not fulfilling to you. He said, well, that's true. I said, what did you love in that company? She, he says, I'm a deal maker. I said, we need you back on the deals. He goes, nobody's told me to do that. Why, why is this? Because if you're not doing something that inspires you, that uses your executive center, that gives meaning to your life, you're going to end up being debaucherous. And you're going to end up having drinks run your life because your amygdala doesn't have anything to shut it down. So I said, so let's go back in the deals. Let's close some deals. You don't have to own the company. Just tell them that I want to do some deals for the company. Get a good commission out of it. You got more money than you know what to do with it, but get a commission, find a philanthropy that you would love to do. That's so meaningful for you. You don't want to be sloshed when you're participating in it. So we got him something that meant something that really meant something to him. And it was an educational. He wanted to open up an educational, um, I guess you could say a school on, on a campus that he went to and build an educational entrepreneurial educational uh, program. And that brought in tears in the eyes. I said, so let's go out and do the deals. Last time you did deals, were you drunk? No. Did you have a social drink? One. I said, let's go do the deals. Let's go build a philanthropic entrepreneur comp college and put it in your name. And let's go make young people and then train them on all the stuff you've learned. Let's give them insights. And is that the guy that want, you want to come in as a slouch or you want to come in as a leader? What do you want? He said, that's the most inspiring. He get tears. Most inspiring thing in my life. His drinking went to one or two occasionally after that. He had a cause. If you don't have a cause bigger than your obstacle, your obstacle runs your life. And the amygdala is a feedback mechanism for letting you know that you've lost contact with the highest priority mission that you could be focusing on that makes a difference in other people's it's bigger cause than yourself. Man, I'm just lighting up. I don't know if you can see it on my face. I'm just, I'm just glowing because you know this. the work that I do is a byproduct of my own story. And I'm hearing this. It's like the mission came. It's like the story with the podcast. Like that was the genesis. And then that grew into Rebuild Recovery. No, I'm just thinking about all the men that we've worked with and, you know, the transformations and the testimonies that we've had inside of our program. It's like these guys come and it's like they think that they had this problem with pornography. In reality, they have a problem with fulfillment. They have a problem with service to others. They have a problem with purpose and passion. So when we begin to set them up and redirect them in life, not only does the, the habit with porn fizzle away, but it's like what they're able to create, more income, more reach, deeper relationships. Sublimated. I guarantee you that if you get somebody onto something that's deeply meaningful to them, yeah, the the, the porn is is nothing. Yeah, now porn here's a here's a we yeah. we we're blaming the porn really, but that's mm -hmm. not the issue. 
it's the executive center's not on. And they're down in there and they're looking for immediate. If you can't fulfill your life with a meaningful purpose and mission, you're going to fill it with food, consumerism, porn, or, or shopping or something like that. That's, you're going to try to consume and fulfill it by another man. Yet that don't mean much. That's just a symptom, though. Now, what about a young man? You know, this is something I'm beginning to come, you know, come across here. You know, obviously, we know pornography. I know this is not your world. This is mine. But the average age of first exposure to high, you know, stimulating internet pornography is around 10, 11 years old. So as these young boys' brains are developing, many of them, I mean, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of them, are spending hours every single day. That's obviously having an impact on their brain. So is there anything that you can pull on or speak to in terms of like a young man's brain that's possibly been hijacked? Like how does he break through and transcend this? If literally same his brain, same, same exact, exact thing. thing. Okay. Same exact thing. I, I have a, I, I, you know, I, porn is not, not just, it, I've seen most people. I've, I've, I've asked thousands of people. How many have you ever looked at porn? Almost everybody puts your hand. Every down. single human being. Every yeah. person, they've looked at porn, but they may not be sitting there consumed by it. They're just looking at it. Okay. There's a guy from Australia that sends me sometimes, I won't, it's not porn, it's not hard porn, anything like, but he sends me beautiful pictures of girls. And I've known him for about 13 years, 14 years, maybe 15 years, something like that. And this all happened in the last two. He's been doing it. He quit his job. Yeah. Retired. And they got nothing else to do. Get young people to find out what their highest value is and get them onto something that's deeply meaningful. I, I have a, a girl who is, uh, who's now, let's see, she's, 50, she's 16. She started a fashion company when she was seven and started doing drawing, seven. By the time she was 11, she had 15 employees and she's been fabric, making manufacturing goods. So now she's in a, in a whole nother place in her life and she's capable of, of uh, you know, doing something today that's powerful. She's not going to be sitting there looking at porn. She's not going to be, she's too busy doing something that's important and fulfilling. If you can't find something that's fulfilling, you're going to end up doing these other things. Fill it up. And, and, or in moderation, you know, if you can get it to be moderate and you see a, a beautiful picture of somebody or whatever, it's a stimulus, that's, I'm not going to judge that. But the reality is if it's running your life, you got nothing to fill it with that's more important. Fill it with something deeply important. So would this take us into your seven, your seven areas of life then? Is that where we would want to start spiritually, yeah. mentally, vocationally, financially? Um, Think about this. When you ask a girl, what, what, what are you looking for in a guy? I guarantee it. I've asked thousands. I mean, tens of thousands. What are you looking for in a guy? I'm looking for somebody that's fit. That was, the mo that was one of the most common ones. Somebody that's fit. This, hold, hold on real quick. Men, get your pens ready because we got one of the world's experts literally interviewed thousands of women. Please share with the men what the yeah. women are looking they, for. They, they would prefer a fit guy that looks like he's, you know, got a little testosterone and, you know, nice, nice bod, wider shoulders, tighter butt, you know, nice, they nice smile, jaw. They're, they're looking for a testosterone male guy. Most of, there's a whole spectrum of girls out there. You know, there's a spectrum of sexuality today, but majority of them still like a good looking man. They're looking for somebody that's intelligent. And they define an intelligent man as somebody who can understand what's important to them and talks in terms of what's important to them. That's important. So if you go up to a guy and, he, and, and, and you have a dream about having a family someday and he goes, look at those beautiful kids. God, I wish I could find a woman that looks like you someday to have beautiful kids like that. He's intelligent. And if he says, you're the most beautiful woman he's ever laid eyes on, he's intelligent. But if he says, look at those runts. Oh, I've never had kids. Nah terrible. She'll think, what an idiot. She's looking for somebody that can communicate in her values and help her be feel fulfilled in her values. So she doesn't have to fix or change herself to be with him. She's looking for somebody that's got ambition that doesn't want to just sit and maybe work at the gas station for the, as a part-time job and live in a trailer house. You know, I'm not saying that that's not a, a, a man, somebody who's going to fit that. But the point is that they're looking for an upgrade in society somehow. They want to, they want to go and do things. You know, they don't want to shrink. I've never met anybody that wants to shrink. No one gets up in the morning and says, I want to shrink my intelligence. I want to shrink my business success. I want to shrink my income. I want to shrink my, my, my relationship fulfillment. I want to shrink my social influence. I want to shrink my physical health and shrink my spirituality and inspiration. They want to expand. So they're looking for a guy that's intelligent, that's fit, that's somebody that's got ambition, that wants to go places and do things. They're looking for somebody that's got resources that has at least as much money in the, as them, not less. 
at least as much as them, most of them. They don't mind. They don't have to be a billionaire necessarily, although they won't turn that down. They just would like to have somebody that contributes at least as much of them, if not more. So they feel secure if they all of a sudden had children. And that's understandable. They, that's a scary thing for them. Then they're looking for somebody that wants them, that wants to zero in on them and not a player. You know, they're looking for somebody that, that wants to, because they have, they have a risk if they have children, they have a risk. They want somebody that's going to be there for them, at least during the earliest times. So they're looking for somebody that really cares about them and shows that they, they do it and, and that that respects them and can, can banter with them. They're looking for somebody that can get along with all their loved ones and friends and family and socially savvy and knows how to adapt to almost any social setting that they bring them. And they want to make sure that their friends think that they're, wow, that's a great catch, a trophy. And they're looking for somebody that's inspired by something. You don't want somebody that's just depressed, bitching, drinking, and going into the amygdala. There's somebody that's got a life that is inspiring to be with. Her. The, 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 they want somebody that with nobility, right? We want nobility. They want nobility. So when, when you look at that, what they're looking for, they're looking to empower the seven areas of life. They're looking for a guy because that enhances their seven areas of life. And that's why my new book, this, The Seven Secret Treasures, is about empowering those seven areas of life. It's because you doing that increases the probability of attracting a mate that's, you know, going to be on that same plane. And you deserve to get somebody that's matching where you are in life, not somebody you're subordinating to or subordinating to, but somebody that's a match. So I think that that's all those seven areas of life are, are something that we're here to empower. That's mastery. And that if you're doing one of those things and engage in one of those or multiple ones of those, you're less likely to be down in your amygdala. You're more in government, more in self-governance overrules amygdala's addictions. Addictions are are signs of not being inspired by something so meaningful that you don't have time. You don't have time for that. I don't have time to go drinking and partying and socializing porn. I don't have time for it. Love that. Love that. And just to, just to cap it here, guys, the seven, seven areas, uh, spiritually, mentally, vocationally, financially, family, and then physically, and then socially being the seventh one. So we kind of touched on them all a little bit there. I want to bring it back to the, the, the designing of our life's plan and kind of vision here. So we start super, you know, super 30,000 foot, right? This is exactly what we want for you. That was like the world map. I want to touch and speak and educate in all these countries. How do we, once we have that high level 30,000 foot view, how do we bring it down to today? So we actually have a step that we can begin to take. The first question, there's seven questions. You might want to write them. Whoever's listening, you might want to write them. What is it I would absolutely love to do with my life? With my life or in my life? What would I absolutely love to be, do, or have? Start there. So I, so I asked myself, what, what is it I'd love to do? I'd love to travel the world, step foot in every country of the face of the earth. Great. What else would I love to have? I'd love to have the opportunity to live anywhere I want to. Anywhere in the world. All over the world. I'm, I'm, I always say, give yourself a, chance, a choice between this, that, both, or neither. So if I said, if I do, I want to live here or here, both <laughs> or neither, you know, I want to give myself the options. Uh, so what is it I would absolutely love to have? This is not a fantasy. I didn't ask what is my fantasy about how I'd like to be. The, a fantasy is something you'll do if it's pleasurable and you'll stop if it's don't, if, you, if it's not. Something you love is you're embracing pain and pleasure in the pursuit of it. You'll embrace both pain and pleasure. And pursuit. Well, if you love to get fit, you're going to embrace the pain of the workout. A fantasy is a pleasure without a pain. That's the addiction. And people that want addiction, they want a fantasy. And if it doesn't match the fantasy, they're depressed. And when they're depressed, they want to escape. And dissociation from that which is depressed is the addiction process. That's the amygdala. The amygdala is always wants the nucleus accumbens to light up when you're feeling happy. I want a pleasure. And they don't realize that there is no such thing. There's always pain and pleasure. Always two sides of life. And the individual that's willing to embrace the pain and the pleasure and the pursuit of a purpose goes farther than the person that's always looking for pleasure. And that was written about by Aristotle. He said there's a hedonistic happiness and there's an eudaimonic happiness, which is wellness and well-being and whole being. That's the one that makes a difference. That's what the Stoics refer to. When a person will fulfill that, they have, they have, that's where the power is. That's, that's where the magic is. So I tell people to go after that. But you, what is it I'd love to do? Absolutely love to do. Second thing is, how do I get handsomely and beautifully paid to do it? How do I get handsomely and beautifully paid to do it? How do I make millions doing it? Don't ever ask yourself, how can I afford to do something? That's the most insane. In, that's debt thinking. How can I afford to go on vacation this year? How can I go on vacation, make an extra million this year? 
<laughs> I, I, I decided that I wanted to go to Egypt, right? And so I looked at all the prices and everything else and checked it all out. And I thought, if I was to get 33 people and, they, and charge 10, oh, this is 10,000 at that time, I could make uh, 33 times 10, that's 330,000, right? $330,000 and go on a trip to, to Egypt. I could then charge 2,000 a head over and above all the costs for me to manage it and coordinate it and do everything else and then write a book on Egyptology for it. So I made $66,000 over a two-week period tearing people in Egypt. And I thought, great, I wanted to go to Egypt and pay to do it. I did the same thing in Tibet. I did it in Greece. I did it in China. I did it in different parts of the world. So I said, I'm just going to go around the world and get paid to travel the world and make millions doing it. Because I asked that question, how can I afford to do that? And then I hired specialists and delegated in specialists. So I got Hawes from Egypt, the great Egyptologist there, right? I had him working for me. I had all these people working for me on this trip and factored in the cost and put it together. And then people came. So I've done this many times. So I thought, how do I do what I love and get paid for it? And that's handsomely paid for it. Not just how can I afford to do it? A lot of people say, I want to just at least break even. Why break even? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Limited thinking. Yeah. I love it when Ivana Trump, Ivana used to live next door to us. And I've known Ivana for 29 years. And she was crazy. She just passed away recently. But Ivana said when she when they divorced, you know, back in the early 90s, they divorced. And, and there was a funny line. She says, I don't want to. Somebody asked her, are you going to get even, get back and get even at, at Donnelly? She says, no, 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 I don't get even. I get it all. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love it. But anyway, the third question what are the highest priority actions I can do today to make that come true or at least get me one step closer? What are the highest priority actions I can do today that will make me one step closer or get me to come true? You have two ways of doing that. The last is first principle by asking, work your way back from the end in mind. What are the highest priority actions? If I did these actions, it would give me that and work your way back by chunking it down or what are the highest priority actions I can do that moves me one step closer? Either one of those gets you there. It's just incremental momentum building actions that keep getting you somewhere. So you ask that and take an action on it and prioritize it for the day and then do the next action. And each time you do another action, you become more clear about how you can get that outcome. The fourth thing is what obstacles might I run into and how do I solve them in advance? What obstacles might I run into? So if, if I go into Egypt, what happens if all of a sudden a, it rains. What happens if all of a sudden the airlines cancel? What happens if all of a sudden um, the hotels aren't standard? What, what do I do in these cases? So I, th I thought of every possible thing. I went to the American Express Travel Service and I went back to them. I said, what are all the problems that we might run into there? And I'm foresighting. And I factored those in and I factored in my cost. I added the cost to make sure I've got all those things as a backup. We were in a, a trip in Peru one time in Bolivia and all of a sudden, the hotel that was supposed to be, we're supposed to stay at, turned out that wasn't the one that, that I agreed to. And so we had a fight with a guy. And, and I thought they were going to probably put me in jail. I told him, no, there's no turning back. I paid for a hotel. You're giving me the hotel. You're not giving me this, this low-priced hotel, high-end high hotel. So I won, the, I won the fight. We got the big hotel. Fantastic dinner that night. But I didn't anticipate that. The next time I did, I anticipated that. So I prepared for that in advance. I had signed documents. I made sure that we contacted the people. That's due diligence. So you prepare by asking, what are the obstacles and how do you solve them in advance? And the more you solve them in advance, the more clear your mind becomes, the more clear the vision becomes, the more you see through the obstacles of a detail, a detail the devil's in the detail, as they say, right? And the, your vitality in life is proportioned to the vividness of your vision and your vision is clear if you get the details. So you plan out the details, think of the obstacles, solve them in advance, like they did the James Webb telescope, or like Elon Musk does it when he goes to these trips to space. He, he can't, he's got to, when he's going out there and doing a launch, he knows he's going to lose some spacecraft along the way, just testing. Factor it in, but he's got to do it. But you remember the day when that thing landed backwards on that ship? Tell me that wasn't an inspiration. First time in the history of any human being that was able to pull that off, a reusable rocket. NASA couldn't think of that. One man thought of that and engineered that feed. And now he's going into space. He went up again with Starlink's uh, uh, another one today. So that's because of foresight, not because of hindsight. Hindsight is trial and error. If it worked, oh, what did I do wrong? And then you beat yourself up. Foresight is preparing in advance. And then when it works, 
you're grateful and you have tears of inspiration. One leads to tears of inspiration and fulfillment, and you're not going to be addicted when you're pursuing those. And you don't have time for it. You're too inspired. The next one is what worked and what didn't work today. And now you metric it. See, I keep metrics. I mean, uh, I, I, I every podcast are, la- are, are listed, right? The types of pos- po- po- podcasts, the titles. I, I mean, we, we keep metrics on the people. We keep metrics on the shows, the interviews, the, the 1,530 magazines I've written for. Everything is metriced and it's, and it's t- detailed. So I know where, when, and who, and how many, and that kind of stuff. I metric that. And I have people helping me with that, have a service that does that. So I know if I set out to reach 7 billion people, we're making it. It's happening. Here's how many people we're reaching already and touching the lives of and da, 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 with what? It's all metric. So in the process of doing that, you what worked and what didn't work? The next question is, how do I do it more effectively and efficiently tomorrow? How can I do what I'm doing more effectively and efficiently tomorrow? How can I refine the skills? Because if I'm not working on it, I'm doing the same thing, expecting different results. What am I doing? What can I do to make it more effective and efficient tomorrow? And the last question, number seven, is how did no matter what happened, no matter what happened, how did it get me my goal? No matter what happened today, whatever obstacles, unexpected, how, did it, how is it one step closer to my goal? How did that happening help me get that goal? How specifically is this event that I thought was a glitch, how is it helping me fulfill my dream, my objective? And don't stop to get it. So you go to bed with gratitude, not anxiety. Because the, the anxieties are stemming from events you didn't see the benefits to. And then you're afraid of that happening again. So you're living in anxieties all the time. And then you're going to want to escape the anxieties with fantasies. So anytime you have a pain, you're going to want to escape it with a pleasure. And then you end up separating the inseparables instead of integrating the inseparables. Integrating them is objective. Separating them is a subjective bias and false, false positives and false negatives. And they stop you from achieving. Wow. Guys, <laughs> it's got probably tens of thousands of dollars of value in a seminar right there from, from those seven questions. Now, some of them appear as like, these are almost questions you can ask yourself every single day. How can I prove tomorrow? How did it get me closer to my goal? What worked? What didn't work? But the bigger ones, like what I want out of life, like how often are you asking yourself some of these earlier questions? Is this a process you do daily? Put it on your, your bathroom mirror. Got it. Okay. <laughs> right next to your can. <laughs> You're sitting and looking at it right in the door there. But I don't use the word, you mentioned improvement. I don't ever use the word improvement. I use the word refinement to more effective and efficient pathways of action. Improvement is a moral language and moral hypocrisies trap people. They make the term success and failure instead of man on a mission. I'm a man on a mission. I don't pursue success because it breeds failure. It makes you fear failure. I don't want a one-sided thing. I want a two-sided thing. So improvement is trying to get rid of this and try to get that. I'm refining it because I learned from both. The, the, the very thing you do that's successful, that makes you proud, humbles you. And the very thing you think that you did with failure lifts you up. Success is a depurposing state of mind. Failure is a repurposing state of mind. If you stay focused on purpose, you don't distract yourself by those two. Those are feedback systems to guide you back to authenticity. Because the second you get proud, you set too big a goal in too short a time frame to humble you. When the second you feel shamed and, and, and failure, you set too a smaller goal in too long a time to build you back up again. They're homeostats trying to guide you back to a man on a mission. A man on a mission, a man with a purpose is something that's bigger than success or failure. I don't ever, people say, well, you're a success. I don't call myself a success. I'm a man on a mission. There's thousands of accomplishments, but you may call it success because that's the total end of your goals, but it's just the beginning of mine. Why is it important for us to pay such close attention to the words that we speak? Well, our words are basically either injected things from others, and we may be not even realizing who our mentors are coming from. A lot of times we subordinate to people. We don't really know them. We just set up a fantasy of who they are. And then we think, oh, I should be that way. I ought to be that way. I'm supposed to be that way. I need to be that way. Instead of, is that even sensible? And is that really, is their life really the life that we're striving? I'm a firm believer not to put people on pedestals or pits. Put them in your heart. Whatever you see that you admire them, stop, identify what specific trait, action, inaction, do I perceive this individual displaying or demonstrating that I admire most? Pin it down, write it down, keep it to five word answers. Then go inside yourself and go, all right, John, 
where and when do I perceive myself displaying or demonstrating that behavior already in my life? And I guarantee you, I've been doing this for a long time, 37 years. I have yet to find an individual that can't find what they admire in others inside themselves. The same thing as you despise. Whatever you despise in others is within you, but you're too proud to admit it, but you have it in there and you feel ashamed of it. That's why they're bug bugging you and you're resenting them. When you admire somebody, you're too humble to admit what you see in them inside you, but you have it and that's why you're admiring them. When you can uncover where it is, you won't envy them, you'll thank them and you'll stand on their shoulders and do something greater. But if you sit and envy them, you'll minimize yourself and then you'll expect to do it in their form, not your form. And your hierarchy of values dictates your form and their hierarchy of values dictates their form. You're not here to be them. That's why Emerson said, envy is ignorance and imitation is suicide. Don't be trying to be second at being somebody else. Don't be a second Elvis, be a first you. That is powerful. Um, Dr. John, you're an absolute gift to, to the world. I know you know that. And I know you're told that probably daily at this point, probably multiple times a day, because I know the, the level of volume of work that you produce. So I'm sure you're getting interviewed quite, quite extensively. I just want to thank you again for joining us again for, for part two here. This has been an incredible, insightful, just jam packed. I mean, literally these, these seven questions is radically going to help people refine, not improve the quality of, of, of their lives. So uh, last couple of minutes here, just, I know you'd mentioned you guys are in Houston filming a couple of documentaries. What's kind of new and exciting. What's kind of going on in your world right now that you're really excited about uh, producing, and creating any big projects? I've got two, uh, 10 new books coming out. Uh, the Seven Secret Treasures is first one. Resilient Mind is in the pre press right now. That'll be out any, any week now. Uh, then I've got The Productivity Factor. We've got 10 books coming out. We've got another company that wants to do another 10 books. I'll probably have 20 books out in the next four or five years. I've just finished a big textbook on physics that I'm doing on, on uh, quantum physics, optics, mechanics, uh, and consciousness. I'm tackling the what is consciousness from a physics perspective, the big 1100 page textbook. I'm doing that. Then we've got uh, some more movies. We'll have four movies coming out from this year. I've got one on autism, got one that's on my own work. I got one that's a, a program they're doing that's gonna be with Johnny Depp, which is about his, his journey, uh, <laughs> the respondent. <laughs> and uh, we did another one that's just recently done it for personal development that's doing it. So we've got movies some coming out. I've got programs that are coming out. And I've got places, I've, I'm getting ready to speak to Israeli leaders uh, in just the 23rd and, and also the port authorities in there when I uh, when we come sailing into the Israel. There's just so many things going on. I'm meeting amazing people. I, I'm a real believer that if you give yourself permission to go and define really clearly what you really love to do in life and you give yourself permission to tar, start taking prioritized actions on it, you're not going to be stuck in addictions. You're, you know, if you don't, if you don't, eat to live and perform, you're going to live to eat. And if you don't fulfill your life with inspiring actions that serve, you're going to end up distracted and impulsively seeking pleasures for immediate gratification. And immediate gratification costs life. Long-term missions feed life and build life and, 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 it, and it builds a life. So by all means, find out what your highest value is. Go on my website, drdmartin.com and do that value determination and go and get prioritized. Your life changes the second you do. What's the work you're doing with autism? There's a video. They, they asked me for my ideas about autism. And so they did a movie on it. And I got interviewed for this. It's a documentary movie on it. I don't know when it's going to come out. Probably first of this next year. It should be coming out about that time. But that, that'll be coming out. And it's, they just wanted all my ideas about what might have led to autism mm -hmm. and the gifts that it offers. Yeah. So shining, shining, I'm shining it. Shining a light. There's... there's when I see a child with autism, I see a child that's got sometimes a very highly selected value system that's not being understood or appreciated. And um, I had a boy that was uh, eight years old, having nightmares, can't tie his shoes, can't speak, can't write, can't do much at all, right? And having nightmares. Parents, bring me, bring me this child. I found out what the nightmares were. They were surrounding with nothing but positive statements and he had no one else around him except people with positive statements and his homeostatic mechanism and his objective center of his brain was trying to balance it with negative thoughts. Because it didn't have any other feedback. You need both positive and negative feedback responses, praise and reprimand to maximally grow. And people who get one without the other will end up creating artificial ones inside their brain in order to counterbalance it. So we got that straightened out, no more uh, nightmares. 
And then we started finding out what his highest value was. We found out the kid was capable of reading incredible speeds. I mean, this kid has read 15,000 books now. He's 20 years old, 15,000 books now. And he consults for corporations today and CEOs today. So th th this is what's autistic children sometimes have such profound concentrated uh, skills. Finding those and letting them ex excel is, is mind blowing. So I, I like to think of him as specialist. This boy was having gamma waves in his brain with Eureka insights on a regular basis. And they were trying to get rid of him instead of honoring him. They were saying, well, we don't know this is this is abnormal. We need to stop it. We need to give him some drug or but stop it. Let him yeah. use those ingenious ideas for creativity. Now he's doing it serving people. So he, is, he, he didn't go to school. He's, he's charging $1,300 a session for CEOs today. He's 20 years old. Okay. And he speaks and he's, he can communicate a different plane today. So sometimes, uh, so that's what my part in autism is. In case there's a, in case there's something you haven't done to unveil their, their genius and navigate through the supposed views that people have, let's find out where that genius is and let's let it out. Uh, John, I love that. I love that so much, man. I have, I have a business partner that uh, is a former Lieutenant within the Navy SEALs. And it wasn't until after his career that he got clinically diagnosed with Asperger's and had it been diagnosed when he was a kid, he wouldn't have made it into the military and have had the career that he did. I truly believe everything that you just said, that these people that have been diagnosed have been given whatever this diagnosed is label. been labeled, labeled as a negative thing are true gifts to the world and possess incredible superpowers. Um, I'd love yeah. to have you back on in the future after this film releases and maybe we can kind of explore some of your theories and ideas yeah. around the, all this. The, I know we're, you know, the, the thing is the labels are just incompetencies. Yes. Wow. Well, John, we're, uh, we're, we're, we're up on the time here. I do, I do apologize. I know he held you a little bit long here today. Do we have time for one final question? 60 seconds. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Well, we'll get all, we'll get all the, uh, the D Martini Institute, everything plugged down, check out the YouTube, connect on social media. I asked this question last time. So I'm curious how your answer is going to compare. I say the title of the show is the Superman life. I believe we're here for a purpose, but we must show up intentionally and aggressively in our actions every single day. And that's what it means to create a super in life. So Dr. G Dr. John D Martini, as we bring today's conversation to a close, how would you define living a superhuman life? A superhuman life? Um, I think living life to the fullest as a human in today's world is a superhuman life. Taking the capacities that we all have and taking them to the utmost and, and fulfilling them by prioritizing. I, that's why I say prioritization. If you stick to priority, you're doing the most any human being can do and you build momentum towards ever greater achievements and the other, other people will label you superhuman in the process. Amen. Guys, check it out. Seven questions to improve your life. Check out the Martini Institute. Do the values assessments. Get clear on what you want most out of life and then create the vision and create the plan to make it happen. Guys, we love you so much. Make sure to leave us a five-star rating review. We appreciate you guys. For Dr. Don Martini, Frank Rich, we'll see you guys next week. <music>